hall, diggy diggy hall, diggy diggy hall. I am a dwarf and I'm digging a hole. Welcome to Stoneworks World Building. Today we're gonna learn everything about how mountains work in real life and in fantasy world building, so that you can hopefully leave this video with more realistic and inspired ideas for your D&D games, storybooks, and Minecraft civilizations. I'm your radio host, Stony Stoner the Mountie Mounter. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and this video was prompted by the request of one of my elite patrons. So join my Patreon and message me your deepest, darkest desires. You know what a mountain is. Unless you live in my home state of Rhode Island, where they call this Mount Hope. Nah. But it's actually really hard to find a good scientific definition for mountains. Cause like, it's either high elevation, or it's rugged and it sticks out. These grand, beautiful landforms have massive implications for how our world works. So today, let's talk about how mountains form and where they go on your world maps, their environments, resources, civilizations, and their effects on war and religion. If you want to skip around to your interests or you get bored with one topic, I added chapters to the bottom of the video right here on the scroll bar. So you better have liked and subscribed or I, I'll be mad, I'll be angry, and I get hungry when I'm angry. The map is often the first place world builders start with their projects, so where on our maps should mountains go? Usually we just kind of eyeball it with intuition, and that's like 50% of the way there, right? Honestly, I'll take a map that feels good with its mountains over an awkward but scientifically accurate one any day. So take this info mostly as inspiration. Mountain ranges mostly form from the Earth's tectonic plates moving around and interacting with each other. Like how the continental Indian plate is crashing into the Eurasian plate to form the Himalayas. Yes, that is how it is correctly pronounced in Sanskrit. I had a teacher who insisted on calling them that, so I'm passing that pedantic pain on to you. The land on the tectonic plate deforms and pushes up to form mountains. Or how the oceanic Pacific plate is crashing into the continental South American plate, and it's sliding underneath which pushes the land upwards and makes volcanoes that further build the mountains. This is how the Andes were formed. So if you want realistic mountains in your fantasy world, the biggest ranges will be in the lines that are on the edge of continental plates. Take a look at what's called the Alpide Belt, a line of multi-layered mountain ranges from France to Indonesia that sit all along where the Eurasian plate interacts with its neighbors. It's also responsible for the splattering, messy shape of a landmass that is Europe. So if you're one of the million world builders out there who wants to add a Mediterranean Sea analog to your map, listen up because it has to do with the mountains. Europe's funky peninsulas exist because the Eurasian plate is actually split up into a bunch of microplates that are part of it but still interact with each other. Spain, Turkey, Hungary, the Adriatic Sea, and the Aegean Sea are all their own little microplates. And on the edges of these plates where they interact, you get Southern Europe's mountains like the Pyrenees, Alps, the Apennines, Dinarides, Pindus, Carpathians, Pontix, Taurus, which all make these peninsulas in Southern Europe. So if you want a bit of your map to look like the Mediterranean, draw some real funky looking blobs in an area and put down some mountain ranges on the lines. Then make those blobs consist of mostly land or sea, and then fill in some regions to account for things like erosion. I came across all this after looking at the Carpathian Mountains and thinking to myself, how the f did this random squiggle get in the middle of Europe? Now, tectonics are weird because the plates can break apart or suture together into new plates. This is why the Ural Mountains randomly cut through Russia in the middle of the Eurasian Plate, because they're super old. The mountains here outlived the tectonic plates that smushed together to make them. The same goes for the Appalachian Mountains, which during the supercontinent Pangaea were formed together as the same range as the Scottish Highlands and part of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. 
So now we need to get the triumvirate of Appalachian bluegrass music, Moroccan choppy, and... So you can straight up just add a few random mountain ranges outside of tectonic plates and it'll be realistic. Especially if you have a few older, more worn down mountain ranges on either side of the ocean or sea. That information is all for the big lines of mountain systems and ranges though. So how do you get the more cluster-like places like the Ethiopian Highlands, the Adirondacks in upstate New York, the Black Hills in South Dakota, and the Central Australian Mountains? Well, you have an interesting kind of uplift, where sometimes magma from the mantle rises up into the continental plates, which cools into rock and then thickens the plate, increasing the elevation of the land above it. Over time, the softer rock of the land gets eroded away, and those big, hard magma intrusions stay put, forming high-elevation, hard rock mountains. This can happen in a lot of places almost anywhere, but it is often associated with tectonic plates. These mountains tend not to be nearly as large as tectonic ranges, but they can be put nearly anywhere on your map and they create some really, really cool landscapes. For this example, I absolutely love the Ethiopian highlands and its geomorphology. Wow, I'm really a dirty fucking Tectonics formed mountains where today's Arabian and African plates were joined together. Over hundreds of millions of years, these mountains eroded down somewhat, and then that magma uplift thing happened and made these highlands. But then the Arabian plate split from the African plate, cutting the mountains in half and creating the Red Sea. This is why the coastal areas around the Red Sea are all mountainous in the Arabian Nubian Shield. And down south in Yemen, where these mountains were part of the younger highlands, they're taller and more rugged. Now today, Africa is actually being torn apart by a couple of things. One, the French. And two, the Great Rift Valley, which has East Africa peeling away from the rest. You can literally see the rift happening in the uplands. It rips this mountain cluster in half and the land erodes away into a new valley. So my world building projects always have a place like this now. It's really cool. Then there's volcano mountains. They could stand either alone or create full volcanic mountain ranges. You either put them on regular tectonic boundary areas, like how Mount Fuji in Japan formed from a triple boundary of three plates, or where rifting occurs and those stresses in the land allow lava to rise up like how Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania formed. Or you could create a hot spot that can really show up anywhere in the world, from making the islands of Hawaii and the Azores to the middle of the Sahara Desert in the volcano mountain Emikosi. But there's also a few other ways that mountains can hypothetically form. In space! If a planet is struck by a giant asteroid, it'll create a giant crater with a little mountain in the center from the, like, aftershock. Now, if that planet is spherical, then the shock waves of that giant impact will ripple through the planet's surface and push material to the exact opposite end of the planet, making mountains appear there. This happened on Mercury. And lastly, if the planet is cold enough, like on Pluto, you can have cryovolcanoes, where water erupts and forms ice mountains. I'm using that last one in a setting that I'm working on now. Now, I'll warn you that if you take this information and just stick lines of mountains on your map, that is lame as hell! Think about adding mountains to your map more as regions with mountain ranges clustered in associated features like plateaus, large valleys, canyons, and sub-mountain ranges. Between the Rockies and Sierra Nevada lies the Great Basin, which formed out of erosion from the surrounding ranges and the rising and expansion of the crust that makes it ripple with many mountain ranges and rolling hills. That's why it looks like this on the map. Or you've got things like the Tarim and Pannonian basins, which are still lowlands because they're mini plates that refuse to conform to the poser uplifting mountains around them. Or the Tibetan Plateau, which exists because once mountains get too big, they can get weak and flatten out over space. It's more interesting to think about mountains as inhabiting both positive and negative space on your map, and leaning into the gray areas of these associated features. 
Far too often, I've just seen world builders place mountain ranges as simple lines down the very middle of their land masses, when in reality, mountain ranges appear on the place's edges and have random smatterings around. But don't forget, looking down on the mountains from a god's perspective or satellites is very different than walking through them and experiencing what they're like. Part 2. Climate and Hazards if you or a character in your story were to walk through the mountains that you're world building, what will they see? Are they rolling hills like the Appalachians, or big rocky outjutting tips like the Apennines and Pindus? Does it literally look like someone just crumpled the land like tinfoil to make it all rugged? Some mountain ranges are big blocks of rock that get eroded down into peaks, valleys, outjuts, and strange shapes. If you told me that the Devil's Tower in the Black Hills was part of your world building project, I would spit in your mouth and you would get turned on by my dominant personality. Or like the fairy chimneys in Turkey. Penis rocks. This is a good time to figure out the general shape and the vibes of your mountain range. How steep and rugged is the entire landscape? Are the mountains just giant rocks that stick out or are they continental sized formations in the land? Do they gradually go up and take a lot of space? Or are they super steep with ups and downs and ridges and cliffs? Are there places with peaks? Are those peaks all along one ridge? Or are the mountains all more discreet from each other with valleys in between? Is the base of the mountain covered in jungle trees? Or is it all barren plains and desert? These questions are a bit easier to answer if you have experience hiking through the mountains, which is an awesome adventure that I recommend doing if you can. But as you climb the mountains, they get colder as you go up. If you were to hike up the Himalayas, it'll go from subtropical forest to deciduous forest to taiga forest to sparser and sparser trees and shrub till it's all rock and ice and glaciers. On top of this, at different patches on the mountain, you'll have areas that have different conditions for sunlight, temperature, wind, nutrients, pollinators, and water. All of these things can be difficult for plants on mountains, depending on where they live. These factors make it so that a single mountain is a patchwork of tons of different microclimates for plants, and the plants will adapt to these niches. I talked about this a little bit in my video about forests, but these unique and isolated niches are why mountain trees can get incredibly strange and alien looking, especially on the more isolated land masses of the southern hemisphere. Like, look at the giant groundsels on Mount Kilimanjaro, which are essentially giant roses that adapted to this climate, or the hardy and twisting pencil pines of Tasmania. In my opinion, fantasy mountains are best if they have some alien and unique trees on them. But like I said, as you go up, the air gets colder and also the winds get stronger. At some point there will be a tree line where trees thin out in patches and can no longer grow. Some trees up here will have to adapt to the strong winds, growing out in crevices or being shaped like flags. It's pretty cool. The small plants, which can live further up than the trees, start getting pumped full of more wacky chemicals so that they don't freeze up here. This makes mountain plants especially good for medicine, perfumes, and drugs. When people say, oh, this is a mystical healing root gathered from the Andes Mountains. Yeah, that's a real thing, even though they're selling you on some bullshit. In Tibet, there's a fungus that takes over mountain caterpillars and has their zombie bodies burrow down so that the fungus can grow out and reproduce. Tibetan people are increasingly trekking up the mountains to collect these fungus stalks because they're worth more than gold. Because a bunch of Chinese dudes are buying them to help them get boners. Y'all are f***ing around over there in China too much. I don't want another pandemic with zombie boner fungus. Way high in the mountains, these adaptations for pollinators have to be weird, because usually it's just a few flies and bees. My favorite example of this is the Sussiora gossip feral, which makes itself cushy and sheltered so that bees come in and they take a nap, which ends up pollinating them. But things aren't all rosy and cute up here in the mountains. When you get to altitudes high enough, the snows will pile up to form glaciers. Now, I used to think that glaciers just sat like big ice cubes on mountaintops, kind of like the big thick ice caps that you see at the North and South Poles, but no. They're actually more giant, really slow-moving ice rivers in the valleys and basins. 
Now you can get something like the big ice caps in the mountains, but that's just if there's a basin that's big enough to form a big, relatively flat ice field. Usually though, there are valley glaciers flowing out of the ice fields. So little did dipsh 12 year old me know that mountains are covered in giant ice snakes. I really like the idea of having an undead mountain king living in an ice castle here on an ice field way high up in the mountains. And the only way that your characters or D&D players can get up to them is by trekking up the glaciers that snake off of it. Because then you get a ton of environmental hazards for them to deal with. Things like big chasms, ruptures, and flooding. Yes, flooding from mountain glaciers is a very, very big problem for the people living in the mountains. When glaciers melt, it usually creates a stream down the mountain and ends up in your overpriced Poland Springs water bottle. But the water also forms large glacial lakes right at the foot of the glacier. These lakes are usually blocked and held in place by moraines of rock and dirt. But these can break, and then all of that water comes flooding down the mountain and destroying a bunch of sh**. Imagine with me. You're walking up a mountain valley, things are peaceful, and you start to notice that the stream gets a bit stronger, and you look up to the mountain top while you're- Think fast, chuckle nuts! Ah, if you got hit by that flashbang at full force, congratulations, a mountain flood would wipe you out with a wall of water. Now here's a key point of this video. Most world builders see mountains as a big, permanent, stoic part of the landscape. I think it's why people often put dwarves hollowing out mountains and making a big city there, because it's seen as a stable and hardy place. No, not really. Mountains are some of the world's most actively dangerous areas, especially the higher you get, because then there's more potential energy with which gravity pulls you down. Ah, oh, shit. Speaking of gravity... Sorry, my mic fell. So mountains are super risky with these flash floods, landslides, avalanches, and also the earthquakes from tectonic plates. Plus volcano stuff. This is why a lot of mountain-faring religion consists of, Hey mountain, here's a sacrifice, please do not kill me today. So with that in mind, my headcanon of the Dwarves Mountain City is specifically built to address this problem. Their lone carved out mountain city, called Suk Uti, devotes a lot of resources to cushioning itself from these cataclysmic dangers. The walls are all curved, hard rock, with many support beams to the ceiling and the floor. And the large rooms, especially, are insulated with soft, cushiony wood imported up from the highlands. Kind of like how a woodpecker's tongue protects its skull by wrapping around it. Sometimes the rooms themselves shift or crack in the middle, so the dwarves will just add bridges or floors over the new cracks. Or they'll use the old space that's tilted for shelves and storage. It makes the layout of rooms rather unpredictable. There's a saying in their language, Oh, he knows where her shelves are to indicate that, you know, people have been sleeping together. Now, of course, these dwarves like their shinies and mostly live off of mining. So let's explore that further in Mountain. Part three, economics. So mountains are good for mineral resources for three main reasons. They simply have more surface area to expose mineral veins than regular flatlands. Erosion can expose old mineral veins and the tectonic and magmatic activity that builds the mountains also makes more valuable minerals and gems within them. So miners and mountains may dig tunnels straight into the mountainside, and they'll bring the product out in carts and down a trail, and they'll dump all the excess tailings down the hill. On one mountain that I was hiking in, in New Mexico, there was an old collapsed tunnel of a copper mine, and there was this big pile of teal blue rocks right next to it, and it was really cool. Or you could just cut the top of a mountain off like West Virginians do when digging up coal. But beware, lots of mining creates toxic junk rock that needs to be dumped somewhere. That could be a cool environmental activist D&D quest, that's all I'm saying. All those college game masters out there, I'm sure there's a cute girl who's an environmental activist, she might want to roleplay that. But medieval mining is actually way more small scale, difficult, and expensive than fantasy dwarves make it out to be those tiny little lying bastards. So most mountain communities end up practicing pockets of agriculture in valleys or grazing. 
I'll get more into agriculture later in an example, but grazing is the livelihood of tons of traditional mountain communities. As long as you have animals which can survive at these altitudes, like the alpaca, Tibetan highland cow, yuck, then they just have to feed on the shrub in the mid and upper vegetation zones of the mountains. But nowadays, for example, Tibetan villagers are having a hard time convincing young people to carry on this traditional grazing because young people are all turning to the cities and tourism industry. White people love to climb and slide down tall sh** in other countries, so there's a lot of money to be made in tourism as well. But that's just the resources for people in the mountains themselves. Mountains are also the lifeblood of a lot of civilizations because they have tinder and are the starting places of rivers. Yes, tons of water comes from mountain runoff, glaciers, and springs. It's only natural. This is why mountains are often culturally seen as places of life, especially in heavy agricultural and irrigating societies. Although because of the rain shadow effect, oftentimes one side of a mountain range is far wetter than the others, but that doesn't always apply. So the land usage of mountainous areas might see little pockets of settlements and cities where agriculture is feasible. In between them, in the more highland and harsh areas, there'll be either rural villages or nomadic tribes of herders. These people will form trade systems of more specialized goods, and contributing to that there will arise more complex culture, politics, and religion. Part 4. Culture there are a lot of people that you can use as examples for mountain people. Tibetans, Swiss, Iranians, Armenians, Mayans, Aztecs, Malagasy, and drunk Jebediah the Cave Dweller. First, let's talk about the general social and infrastructural effects that this environment has, and then get into mountain cities and settlements. I will try to explain some noticeable trends regarding how mountain civilizations function, but know that these different cultural logics will contradict each other's trends, so I am just generalizing. Traditionally speaking, mountain peoples are often minority groups that are pretty culturally conservative. Mountain climates are often pretty harsh and dangerous, so they have limited food and they can't grow a huge population, and they need to adhere to strict social customs so the youngins don't do anything stupid and get themselves killed. It's also hard to travel in rugged mountain terrain, and societies can be extremely fragmented and isolated because of this. This is why the mountainous terrain of ancient Greece led to the formation of large city-states instead of unified empires, and why the Caucasus are crazy linguistically diverse. Also, fun fact, the thin mountain air makes it easier for languages to develop ejective sounds like like in the Georgian word for water, tkali. Rugged terrain also makes it hard to develop and conduct trade, and leads to mountain ranges being seen as kind of a backcountry. The Uyghurs, Tibetans, Kurds, and Scottish are all mountainous people that came to be dominated by lowland people around them. But the difficult accessibility of mountainous regions also makes them decent safe havens from imperial powers. Oftentimes refugees will flee to mountainous areas because it's really hard to track people down here, like happened in Genghis Khan's childhood. And it's really hard to dislodge inhabitants from places fortified in the mountains. There is a reason why the Chinese Communist Party took the long march through the mountains of Yunnan, because they were retreating after losses in the Civil War. Now a lot of people died, but they came around to win, so I'd say it was a pretty good choice. I think this is also why mountain people are often seen as really stubborn and clinging to their identity a lot. Besides the strict social customs, they have natural physical advantages that push them to resist outsiders more than others. And I'm not just talking about those sexy, oiled up Scottish muscles. Don't grease me up, woman! Now there are obvious exceptions to all this, the main one being what I've been saving for the big reveal, the Incan Empire. The Incas were actually the final iteration of a longer line of Andean civilizations, like the several cultures descending from Norte Chico, and the states of the Moche, Tiwanaku, Wari, Chimor, and then the Incas. An empire this big and complex doesn't spring out of nowhere. Hi, I'm Stony, and I'm your new high school history teacher, nice to meet you. The Incas made mountain living work through agricultural innovations, strict communal customs, and a system of roads and bridges across the Andes. In this way, they became the real imperial metropole of South America. And people didn't flee to the mountains to escape empire, 
they fled to the lowland jungles and plains. I told you that mountains are a patchwork of different biomes and climates, right? As you go far north to south, you'll find similar climate spots in the mountains along the whole chain. So where the lowlands go from thick jungle to plains to desert, the mountains have similar climate areas all along here, uniquely turning the mountains into a connecting force rather than a separating or isolating one. This is especially big when we think about agriculture here. It's hard to grow stuff in the mountains, but with all this climate diversity, you can find areas to grow a bunch of different crops, especially at different elevations. So the biggest issue for starting farms then became soil quality. In response to this, Andean peoples got really, really good at figuring out which soils and areas were good for farming what. It was so important to them that their mythological origin story has the gods charging the OG Inca founder to go out and find the place with the right soil quality using a golden rod. But once you have that good soil, erosion and water runoff are big problems. But the Incas made it work because they communally built aqueducts and terraces that prevent erosion. They were also able to domesticate and breed crops to be better suited for high altitudes in different conditions, like how they farmed dozens of kinds of potatoes, or adopted corn from Mesoamerica and bred it to be hardier. I made a whole shiny video on agriculture if you want to know more, so click that like button and just f***ing cave in the forehead of that subscribe button with a stapler. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Likewise, travel is really hard in the mountains, but the Incas made it work because they communally built roads and bridges. A little pattern's emerging here. They got a little work done through communal labor. The Incan government strictly controlled labor and tribute resources. They used work as taxation for the regular people, and they took about two-thirds of people's agricultural output. And in return, the people got food, shelter, clothing, religion, and a skull that was not shattered by a mace. Sometimes I watch horrific videos of people dying just to feel something again. The harshness of the environment favored conditions that saw people working together in a tightly organized, authoritarian, command economy kind of way. Oh, your son didn't lay the gravel for the potato terrace right? Take a stick and just whack. One of the families you oversee didn't send their man to help build a bridge? Fucking whack. The farmers are gathering sticks without permission from the government? F whack! They're outside and they're coming for the stick stockpiles? Wait, no, no, ow, no, 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 no! The environment of the Andes selected for this kind of centralized control because societies that ran this way had more efficiency and output up here in the mountains. But this also came at a huge cost. They had to keep track of their citizens with a bulky census system, keep peoples divided into familial social units called ILUs, and create a robust network of messengers and record keeping. Developing a civilization in rugged mountains can be hard, so you have to do some hardcore sh**. So with all of this stuff, along with some good old fashioned god king military diplomacy, you get social and technological innovations, and an empire of big mountain cities. But these mountain cities are strange. If you're thinking about adding urban centers in the mountains, you should first think about the region's valleys, basins, and plateaus. Most cities aren't built up on steep mountainsides or high mountaintops. Machu Picchu is iconic partly because it's a mountain citadel up on a high ridge, which is far more exotic and impressive to see than a lower valley settlement. That's the exception that proves the rule. Although, rule of cool, Machu Picchu's pretty cool. Like Solitude and Skyrim, things are pretty cool. The early and medieval history of Switzerland is focused on towns and land claims that are mostly in the lower foothills and the valleys, despite the romanticized image of people living up on the mountaintops. Things being consolidated in the valleys allows for a bit more centralization, because people can efficiently control the land by blocking off the exits, blocking the water source, or building a fort that overlooks the whole thing. Like, there's a reason why the establishment of the Tibetan Empire started with the capital Hlasa extending control over a big river valley, then expanding its control out to all of the plateau, the surrounding mountains, and even downstream of that river valley into modern Bangladesh. 
A high altitude capital that I've recently been interested in is the city of Tiwanaku, which grew before the Incas came around in the Andean Altiplano Plateau, growing powerful due to its agricultural surplus from farming innovations, resources from Lake Titicaca, and its impressive religious megastructures. These cities are gonna pop up and become really big for a few main reasons. Defense, local resources, far-flung trade, and religion. Mountains offer defensive and home field advantages because it's difficult to attack upwards, and they also make knowing the local terrain and paths really important. Local resources doesn't just mean ore deposits or Chinese boner fungus, by the way, but also agricultural space and water resources. This makes mountainous settlements pretty densely populated, even if most of the mountains themselves are relatively open and rural. And far-flung trade pops up because the mountains are natural barriers to travel. But that means that there's people on either side of the mountain range with different resources, cultures, and demands. So a business pops up for getting trade goods either around or through the mountains. The ancient Tiwanaku state benefited greatly from this, as well as the Central Asian city-states of Sogdiana, although they were less mountainous than just right next to all the mountains, same thing. Now, I think the development of cities out of religion is a bit of an oddball here, but it's impactful no matter how you spin it. Oftentimes, religious ascetics will go out into the mountains and form isolated monasteries, and sometimes people will settle around those monasteries. Similarly, settlements that have the resources and the convenient location to host religious festivals or temples can grow way larger than surrounding villages, because it'll become a cultural hub and it'll gain from the religious tributes given there. This is a bit of a phenomenon everywhere, but I feel like in mountains, religious organization tends to become a bit more pronounced. This is an idea and feeling more than a substantiated claim, so let me know what you think in the comment section down below. In lots of tropical environments, people end up creating mountain cities and civilizations, maybe because it's cooler or offers different resources, but the most convincing theory I've heard is that it's because there's less disease up here. So when world building mountain civilizations, I think it's best to question, first, what kind of people do you want up here? Do you want it to be tribal nomadic clans of stubborn warriors? Do you want it to be an urbanized and well-coordinated empire? Do you want somewhere in between where there's a social and religious through line that connects people culturally but doesn't dominate over them politically? So keep that in mind. In your world building, I would say start there and then work your way backward to see if they're pastoralists or have good agriculture or have roads and all that kind of detailed stuff. But no matter what you choose, some of these b are gonna end up fighting. Part 5. War A war in the mountains is no joke. The rugged terrain, the small, winding, precarious paths, and the difficulty of logistical support. If you're waging a medieval or fantasy war in the mountains, you better hope it's a defensive war and you've got home field advantage. Or you've got some dragons that you're riding on. There's a lot of reasons why it's difficult. First, on a large geopolitical scale, mountains are a shield from invaders because they are hard to pass. Like, Rome really benefited from the protection of the Alps to their north, except for the invasion of Hannibal! But even he had a bunch of his men and elephants die by falling to their death, freezing and attacks from the locals. It was ballsy and successful, but other people didn't cross the Alps with an army in the winter for a reason. The ruggedness of mountain terrains makes it so that conventional, organized field battle tactics do not work very well. When there's massive rock faces and steep slopes, it's difficult to muster regular battle formations like a phalanx or a shield wall. Cavalry cannot charge at all unless you're fighting on a clear field or a valley, because horses are going to get injured and stuck on the uneven and rocky terrain. The best example of this is the second war fought between the Romans and the mountain Samnite tribes of South Central Italy. The Samnites would hit the clumsy and blocky Roman phalanx formations with fluid hit and run tactics. So the Romans adapted their formations into what's called maniples, which are much more flexible, can turn to face an enemy way faster, 
and can maneuver around rough terrain without breaking formation, so soldiers in the mountains might need to adopt new tactics, skills, and equipment. Maybe they should learn rock climbing, mountain navigation, skiing, and maybe they should adopt lighter weaponry and armor to make all this travel easier. But I personally find the most interesting part of mountain warfare is the tactical logistics of it all, especially if you're writing a D&D campaign like this. Because mountain paths are so windy, unpredictable, and difficult to navigate, an army is either going to need really good maps or a local guide. Not having this could end up with your guys in a valley, and then suddenly a group of local warriors blocks off all your exit points, and now you're either besieged in the valley or you have to fight uphill to get out. Or maybe the guide knows that there's a choke point in the mountain paths that one army and another army are racing towards, because the first to get there is going to be able to cut off the other from a defensive position. You could have your characters or players try to convince guides or locals to give you maps or extra tips about what they could do. I mean, this is how the Spartans lost at the Battle of Thermopylae. They successfully held a strong defensive position between some mountains and the coast, until a local told the enemy Persians about a mountain pass around the Spartan position, and they snuck around their flanks and then killed them all. There's also the issue of baggage trains. Since it's harder to move and trade over rugged terrain, the lines that carry an army's food and supply can get really bogged down. This had catastrophic results for Mark Antony's campaign on Parthia, he marched with his army through the mountains on the shorter, more difficult route to his target city of Frata. But his baggage train, siege engines, and Armenian allies marched the longer but easier route. So as Antony was besieging Frata, the Parthians jumped on his less defended baggage train and cut him off from his supplies, which forced him to humiliatingly retreat from the campaign and suffer a lot of casualties in the Armenian mountains winter. Marcus Antonius? More like Marcus Antono. Now, if you're doing a D&D campaign in the mountains where you're fighting, this terrain is just begging for enemies to lob boulders and logs and carts down at the players. This actually happened to Alexander the Great's army as he invaded into the mountains of Thrace. The Thracians lobbed a line of their wagons down at his army, but he beat this tactic by training his soldiers to lay flat with their shields over them or to move out of the way. Yeah, this part was a bit easy to draw examples for because I watch a lot of Historia Civilis in my downtime. But also, if I do a world building video and I don't mention Greco-Roman stuff, some of you viewers get really mad at me. So there you go. But meet me in the hill so I can beat you over my head with my Makwawitl of pre-Columbian supremacy. I will cut your heart out! Part 6. Religion. Mountains are pretty much always spiritually important. There's a near universal feeling that one gets from mountain vistas or summiting a peak and looking down around the world. It's crazy, and it's very special. The Hebrew Bible has Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. The Gospel of Matthew has Jesus on a mountaintop where he meets the prophets Elijah and Moses. And Islam has the angel Jibra'il dictating the Quran to Muhammad as he meditated in a mountain cave. And that's just the Abrahamic sh**. I think there's four reasonable things that influence religious interpretations of mountains. Their perceived power and connection to the divine, their danger in climbing and traveling, their resources and potential riches, especially for like gold mining, and finally questions of how they got there, or why unique ones look the way they do. The connection to the divine is a through line in many mountain myths. They are physically massive and powerful. They rise up, and they are humans' closest reach to the heavens. Until America came along and invented airplanes and moon travel, eat sh**, land dwellers. So logically and emotionally, being up on a mountain brings you closer to the gods. There's also the idea of an axis mundi, the center of the world. It's a bit difficult to explain, but an axis mundi is a point on the globe by which people mentally orient themselves in space. Like, the center of the world in most Jewish and Christian thought is Jerusalem. Mountains are inherently good candidates for physical access mundis, because they're so conspicuous, and they seem big and strong enough to be able to anchor the world in place to rotate around it. I think all it takes for a mountain to be a good access mundi is that it has to have some really important stories behind it. I mean, hell, Jerusalem sits on a little mountain called Zion, 
The best example of a mountain axis mundi is probably Mount Kailash, which is seen as the center of the cosmic world to many Hindus, Jains, and Buddhists. In both Indian epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, it's supposedly the abode of the god Shiva, but also a portal to the heavens and to liberation. As well as those things, it's seen as an important location of many events and individuals, like where some people attained enlightenment or performed miracles. I think if people live in an area for long enough, landforms that stand out and are interesting tend to just accumulate stories around them, whether historical or mythological. And that's what makes a place sacred to a religion. And this is especially true and prevalent to mountains, because they stand out pretty well. Now the danger of mountains makes them good settings for hero myths. Up here there can be physically demanding challenges, dangerous environments and animals, and no oxygen. But the danger here also keeps mountainous areas unexplored and mysterious. There's a trope called the king asleep in the mountains, where a ruler of a past golden age is said to be still alive, preserved and hidden in the mountains, waiting for a new time to come out and make everything right again. Striking down the false gods of the tribunal, casting out the outlanders, and reasserting the sixth house unmourned. The game Morrowind has an interesting take on this because the main mountain in the game is supernaturally dangerous and the Sleeping King is a deranged poser with godlike powers. Then there's also the riches of a mountain. Think of the Hobbit's Lonely Mountain where the dragon sits on piles of gold treasure. Or there's a Chinese myth that has a mountain of 10,000 magical treasures underneath it, which ends up trapping a greedy king who wanted to take them all. It's a simple format. There's a mountain with a boatload of treasure in it, and we have to go explore its depths and do something dangerous in order to get them. And finally, you get the creation stories of the mountains. The Oglala Lakota tell of the Black Hills origin from three spirits that aided a girl running away from a giant bear. So they rose the hills out of the ground in order to protect her and slow the bear down. This myth seems to harp on how difficult it is to travel in mountains. One version of the Hawaiian Pele myth tells that the volcano Kilauea was formed after the goddess Pele was chased by her sister and killed at the site of the volcano. Her body then became the volcano and lava while her spirit still inhabits the lava chamber. This one seems to harp on how the mountain is visibly building itself from within. So there's a lot of religious connotations and stories surrounding mountains. But if you're world building more for, say, a D&D game, you're going to want to tap into the more physical and active expressions of religions like rituals. Mountain related rituals usually involve people asking for the gods to assure their safety, to continue giving resources, going on pilgrimage to sacred sites, and not to f***ing explode Pompeii style. Mountain climbers in the Himalayas may know a bit about these, because oftentimes they're made to pay respects and give prayers for safety before they start their climb. And the connection to the gods also makes them a really good candidate for where you should do some human sacrifice. The Incas sometimes took people, probably captured warriors or ritualistically chosen children, ouch, and they would bring them up to the extreme mountain peaks so that they would freeze to death as a sacrifice to the gods. The Aztec rulers used mass human sacrifice as a way to terrorize their enemies and their own population, and they did it at the main pyramid in the city center. This was called the Serpent Mountain, as it was a ritualistic recreation of a mountain in their mythology, where the war god Huitzilipochtli disemboweled his mother's murderer and threw her body down the side of the mountain. The Aztecs did the same thing in their rituals, and at the bottom of the temple stairs was an artistic depiction of that god disemboweled and flayed. So they physically recreated this mountain and the symbolism of that story as a public platform over the crowds below. So mountain religions, super interesting. Honestly, when I was researching this section, I expected to find more direct spirit of the mountain types, or like the kami of Mount Fuji, whose name is Konohana Sakuya Hime. Funimation, I hear you're hiring. But most of the mountain stuff that I found was more indirectly using the mountains as a powerful setting, or as an allegory for some need that the mountain fulfills, or as a representation of a figure's divine status. It's some really interesting stuff. At this point in the video, I was planning on talking about one of my own world building projects. Friends of the channel will be familiar with the Coda Lakes mouse world building project that I have going. 
this is an extension of that for a larger TTRPG system. I wanted to tell you about a chain of mountains that has prairie highlands that are filled with bugs, with roving gangs of dragon-like birds and raptors and eagles, which cover the mountain tops with guano and potassium white rocks. But the scope of this project is a little bit too big and incomplete for me to start talking about it here, so stay tuned for future updates on that. From my headcanon of the dwarves to my Minecraft server, to the Black Hills and the Himalayas and the Andes. I hope that I've shown you a lot about mountains for you to incorporate into your own world building projects. And I hope that I've given you a little bit of inspiration and understanding for just how complex and interesting these things can be. So thank you for watching and listening. I've been Stony, and if you want to tell me which topics to cover in the future, make sure to join my Patreon, and I'll see you later.